This is the uh, final session for today, but um, I just uh, we were talking with Tom, uh, and and he has some additional information on the basis, and he's filled us some questions. He's calling it the teaser. Oh, the teaser. <laughs> Uh, Tom is a salesman at the other end of this table. <laughs> this is, uh, he will have to explain. Of course he will. No, it, it's, it's up to him. But uh, uh, and, and, and after I finish with what I'm talking about, then you know, after those questions, then Tom will explain a little. And for those who wish to say, and we, we do have the room later, uh, there's g g going to be enough um, uh, time to you know for Tom to get into you know what he wants to get into. Um, I'm going to talk about something, and, and uh, it's sort of Ill, not ill-formed in my mind, but I want to explain, in a way, where we are, why the end game is the way it is, and the end game is best explained at its beginning. Um, a friend of mine, he knew Mark, uh, Edwards Deming very well. Edwards Deming is known for... Um, uh, his transformation of Japan into a post-industrial power, the father of quality. But Demings himself was a physicist and he was really uh, sort of thought like an engineer. He was a systems guy. Very, very, you know, focused, very dedicated and saw everything as a system. And one of Demings' uh, precepts was that it's the first 15% that counts in anything that you do. When you start out, that's why to Deming it was very, very important that you knew where you're going, how you wanted to get there, and you could be, adjust for change. But you, the clearer you were in the beginning, the better your results were going to be at the end. And in fact, if you had problems at the end, it was because of what was done at the beginning. You can trace it back. You can trace it back. Now, we are at the what has been called the end game is the resolution of what has gone before. Okay, that the market imbalances, whatever you want to call it. The end game, the, the payment of sin. <laughs> you want to get you know moral about it. But that's what we're talking about. And that's what we're here, and we're watching an unraveling. We're watching the end game begin. But for some clarity about the end game, what I want to do is go back to the beginning of the game itself. The game that we are seeing unravel right now began in the late 17th century, 1694 in England. All right? And it began um, with King William who was really French and he had taken out the English and he owed a whole lot of money for his wars. All the kings, all the kingdoms in Europe were basically at war with each other, trying to take each other's kingdoms. It was just one war after another, which was very, very expensive. They, they uh, financed these wars by borrowing money from the money lenders, who were the, who were the goldsmiths, all right? And, you know, people died and the goldsmiths made money and the kings had wars. Everybody was happy. I'll win, win, win. <laughs> and this was a particularly difficult period for King William. He, he had all these debts, didn't quite know, know what to do, and somebody had this brilliant idea. And I don't think he thought it up, but I, the, the money lenders did. And what they did is they cut a bargain that has led us to where we are here today and in this very room. And the bargain was this. They went to the king and they said, you have all these debts, all right? And um, he admitted it, yeah. And he and, and you know, and he was ready to you know sell his kingdom for gold, which he had done anyway before. And he said, "We got this idea." And the idea is, he goes, "Well, what?" He says, "Listen, you let us issue the currency of the realm, the coin of the realm, and we'll take we'll take care of you." Now he was he could have been a suspicious guy, but I assume that King William heard those words, "We'll take care of you." What do you mean, "We'll take care of you"? Oh, you have all the wars you want. Yeah. How can you do that? I mean, before, the king had to go, had to raise the money, spend the money, lose the war, win the war, and then, bar then pay back what he did by taking over lands or, or looting or stuff like this. And this was rather an extraordinary thing that he heard when these, these money lenders, they're called money lenders, there was not, they were not called bankers. There was no word for banking at this time. All right? They were money lenders. And, they, and then the deal was this. They said, no, no, let us print the money. He said, well, we have money. He said, yeah, but we're going to make a whole new kind of money. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to get pieces of paper and print it on it. And it's going to be money. He says, well, I, 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 you get them to convince me. He says, well, you kill anybody, you won't take it. You make it by law. You know, they've they got to take it in payment of debt. And I'll, I'll stand behind it. And if anybody else prints money, because the English are a very enterprising lot. Martha and I were at the Bank of England last year and during Christmas. We went through the bank tour at, the, at Threadneedle Street. And we're walking through. We had different motives than most people. You know, <laughs> most people looking at the bank. Martha and I go, oh, this is the, oh, look at this. You know, we, we saw it with entirely different, different eyes. But what they did was, you know, when they started doing this money coming out of the Bank of England, 
the English started doing themselves. I mean, I got paper, stamp, you know, engravers, and they were hung publicly. And just pretty soon, counterfeiting just dropped way down. All right, way, way down. And they had they had the deal. It was really a, a great deal. And 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 but the, this doesn't sh tell you what the money lenders got from. But the money lenders got, now these guys are, are money lenders, okay? So what, this is what you got to do. When you go back to the beginning of a system, when you're looking at the first 15% and following it through the end, you have to ask yourself the question, what was going on? What was the driving intent? What started it all? And it really was, on this side, it was profit. Just pure profit. That's what they wanted, okay? They wanted profit. Now, how did they profit? Well, what they used to do before, having gold, is that people would come in, and they'd loan the gold out, and they'd charge interest on the gold, and blah, 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 and that's how they made their income, okay, Ch charging interest on the gold. What they found out along the way before this time is that not everybody wanted the gold at the same time, so they could loan out more, you know, or, or the piece of paper's obligations or give credit, and, you know, so they made more money on that. But what really happened here, what was, what was extraordinary, was that prior to the deal in 1694, the money lenders made money by loaning out gold. All right, and getting interest on that gold. After the deal with the king, they didn't loan out gold anymore. They loaned out paper. Wow, and they got interest on the paper. Okay, now that's extraordinary. That, I mean, that's alchemy. <laughs> Previous to this time, all these alchemists were trying to take, you know, ore, silver, you know, do some mumbo jumbo to it, and, or base metals, copper and lead, and, you know, spit on it and, you know, and put it outside at night and go out and hope you silver gold. It wasn't. All right? These guys circumvented entirely, went straight to paper, called it money, all right, which they could not have done had they had not the agreement of government, which was King William. That was government. Okay? <laughs> now, what did the government get out of this? Well, it's easy to see what the bankers got out of this. Okay? The profit bankers, bankers. Okay, it doesn't matter here. This is bankers. But now they call themselves bankers. Prior to this deal, they were money lenders. After the deal, they were now much more respectful. The king loved these people. They were called bankers, okay? And they were making bank. They were truly making bank, all right? Now, how do these people make money? Do they sell widgets? Do they have restaurants? Do they earn their fare as men of the night? With lipstick? No. <laughs> they indebt people. All right? They were able to go out, have a, a lot of paper, and hand it out to you who come in, let's say you, you're a baker, to the person who, who's growing things, to the, the shipbuilder. They're taking advantage of commerce. And here they provided a great service. Okay? They provided a great service because what it is, they feel creativity, they feel work, they feel productivity, they feel it, all sorts of things. All right? And what do they get out of it? Profit. All right? Profit. By giving these people pieces of paper, by somebody else's productivity, by somebody else's hard sweat, who paid back that debt with compounding interest. So in other words, the credit emanated from this side of the deal out there and started multiplying. Like a virus. Like a virus. When you went to bed at night and you woke up the next morning, you owed more than when you went to bed. All right? You didn't do nothing. The banker didn't do anything. But you owed more when you woke up the next morning. This is an amazing way to make money. All right? Amazing way to make money. So the government over here loved it because he got an unlimited supply of, of money from the bankers. It was his bank. You know, they called it the Bank of England, but it was really their bank. And the, the, the amazing thing that happened here was that people really didn't notice and they didn't understand was when they did this, another thing happened. Prior to the 1694 deal, the king or the queen of England, these were private debts. It was a house of, ooh, a house of whatever they call it, house of roses, house of chrysanthemums, house of blah, blah, Stuart. It was a private debt. They won a war, they owed the money. After this deal, the debts of the king were the debts of the people. Now, I don't know if the people were at that deal. I don't think they were. I think the king was there, the bankers were there, and they cut this amazing deal. All of a sudden, all the obligations of the king or the queen were, were a burden assumed by the people. There was now a direct obligation of the people. It hadn't been before. 
Haven't been before. So this was an amazing process. Okay, so now we got England doing it. All right. We are now in Australia. You guys are a in the flow of this process. You got banks. I mean, you, you can speak English. You know, you know how it works. You you lived up in it. You know you, you this is work. Okay. Now over here on the other side, there was a place called the USA. All right. Just like Australia. Same thing. Went over. They took it over. You know, planted the flag. You know, shot a few Aborigines and went hey and you know, God bless the Queen. And all of a sudden, we got a new kid, new new place going on. New game. All right. Well, what happened in America was really, really worth remembering, because that's all it is now is remembering. <laughs> what happened in America was that there they are, left by the way out there, okay, this huge land, and they didn't have any money, but they had a lot of pro they had a lot of hardworking people. They had, you know, they're trying to, you know, all these people who had come out of nothing with England, tried to make a living for themselves, and they, and they pretty much did, and there was no money around. So some enterprising soul decided to do script, like a piece of paper, okay? And it was sort of controlled, and they kept it under control. All right, unlike the, um, unlike the tile chips of brawn, all right? <laughs> <laughs> they kept it under control. And so they, they were passing this stuff around, you know, wheat, you know, farmers, fish, you know, carpenters, and, you know, it was sort of, it was a, you know, a homegrown job of currency, but it, it worked for whatever reason. And, and then... Um, <laughs> this is how the cat got out of the bag. Um, some Englishman came over from the court, and he's walking around. And, My God, look at this! Everybody seems to be happy. You know, I mean, happy. Things are working. And and he asked uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was showing him around. Um, wow, how come you guys are so prosperous? Well, Benjamin Franklin. I guess did he, I don't know if he said pride goes before a fall, or somebody did. But look what happened. Quite proudly, he told the, uh, the king's representative, "Oh, this is what we do." He said, we, we, we print this money, we hang it, blah, 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 blah. And the guy from England, well, where's Arca? Where's Arca? This is, this is not what we conquered your land for. This is not what we sent the ships over for. This is why we don't go off on, on this thing called imperialism. You know, where's Arca? So they went back to England and they made it illegal. They made the American currency illegal. And they started doing direct levies on America because they wanted gold. They Gold. Gold. Ah, uh, let's go back to gold. Where is the gold in the deal? Because you got to keep your money on, you keep your attention on the money or lack thereof. All right. What happened here was this: the English people and the bankers were not stupid. In fact, they were brilliant in retrospect. And for a long time, fortune favored them. What they did was this: the paper was out there. People were like, paper. It is paper. You know, they they hang you, cord you, or whatever. You know, to make sure you took their paper. But the bankers went, like the money lenders went, now bankers go, mm, listen, in, in this uh, bank, and they now call it a bank, it's on Threadneedle Street, it's what they call the city, we have all this gold. Okay, we have lots of gold. And, and the paper that you have, that you call money, and you're walking around, we put our stamp on, is backed by this pile of gold. All right? There it is. Wow, okay, so everybody's happy. Now, they knew the way this thing worked was, it was, sort of, it was sort of a confidence game because they're printing more paper, they're putting more interest on it, but if people, they, went, they needed people to believe that this was not just pieces of paper. They needed it to believe that there was hard, something hard, something real behind it because people are real cynical, okay? <laughs> and so they, they kept the rules. They really did. They kept, put a lot of gold there and they, and they tried to keep the rules. They, they went to war with each other and they, they would trade, you know, gold and silver among the nations and they, they, this gold standard developed, all right? And, and what the professor has, has uh, shown us is that the gold standard was not to keep prices the same, even though prices were very much the same. I mean, uh, <coughs> you know, they used to say the cost of a, of a, a British flying bespoke tailored suit stayed the same for centuries, okay? Because of the gold standard. And when the gold standard, these things started skyrocketing. But the professor's point of view about the gold standard is that not only did it stay to keep prices with some of the line, it stabilized interest rates, all right? The gold was there, paper was out representing gold, but they kept it in line and it kept the currency in line, and it kept it stable. Producers and savers need stability. Producers and savers need to know that what they're growing today, they can sell tomorrow at X price, and the money they make it back, they need to know it's their, it's their ground of being. It's the thing that they need. It's like you need blood to be pure. You need blood to perform a certain function. I mean, your, your brain needs it, your body needs it. You know, you need, you need the blood. It's gotta be a certain way, okay? 
Now, what I want to tell you is that in the beginning, it was like this. You had a, they, now true, they introduced plasma in it. It wasn't real blood, this is paper. It no longer gold and silver. They had gold and silver coins floating around too. But basically, once they introduced paper in, it was like plasma. But as long as they kept a gold backing in there, it worked. Okay, now it worked. Now, what did this do to this side? This was absolutely amazing. Because one of the deals that the, that the government got out of this is that they could go to debt real quick. They could go to debt, why? Because the bankers would give the government the money. Why did they go to debt? Because he still wanted to take off. His brother in Hanover, his cousin in France. He still, the king still wanted to take over the rest of the world. That's what they all wanted to do back then. It was basically gang warfare. The Crips and the Bloods with fine European names. Okay? <laughs> and they did. Now, why did the English take over? Because they had all the money to raise the Navy on debt. They didn't have to go out there and get gold and silver. They went straight to the banks. The banks were doing it. Everybody accepted it. The people in the British shipyard were going, you know, make these, you know, do the cannery, you know, get the stuff. And these guys singing hi ho, whatever they sang, you know, HMS Pinafore went around one country, pa boom, blew them off the socks, took them over. You know, British flag went over the world, and pretty soon, within 150 years, they owned the damn place pretty much. All right, this little island owned the place. And that's what we're speaking in English today. That sounds successful. All right, now. So, there, and the profits kept flowing back, the profits kept flowing back, the profits kept flowing back. The interesting thing about profit and debt is this, is that they set in motion their own downfall. No, not their downfall. They set in motion their own nemesis. And the source of that nemesis was the source of their profit, compounding interest. All right? The, the thing that allowed them to make money while they slept. It's a wonderful thing to do if you can get on the right side of the deal. All right? is that it grows faster than the front end. It's driving it. If, the, if your economy cannot pay off the debts that it is setting in motion with the issuance of credit, you collapse. Simple as that. One in, one out. Simple as that. It has to stay ahead of compounding debt, which is no easy task. It's not at all. I mean, you have set in motion a nightmare virtually. How did England handle it? They kept growing. They kept over knocking country, knocking over country, knocking over country, knocking over country, and they chewed them up, and they, they you know, all, and that, that Navy wasn't cheap. But they got enough lucre from their worldwide imperialism to pay off, pay off basically the, most of the debts owed by the English people, okay, by the treasury. What happened along the way was, um, it, they still, that, that chewing up of debt, the armies, the navies got so bad, by 1840, something happened that had never happened in the world before. Income tax. England came up with the income tax. Because their previous levies on the productive aspects of the economy could no longer pay off the, the debts of the government. So they went, hey, we're just going to make you pay. Uh, not based you bought anything, not based on a levy of three kids. Anybody with three kids pays us 10 pounds. No. Whatever money you make, we get a cut up. Wow. Damn, huh? If you're them. Okay? And so the people had to give up a cut for the first time of their income. So now we have what came out of this incredible thing? Paper money and the income tax. Okay? So we're, this is where it started. So now you have... This thing spread over the rest of the world. As long as England's empire could stay in front of the compounding debt, they were doing well. Okay? What happened is, it only worked for a certain amount of time. By the mid-19th century, they started choking up. They had run out of the world. They pretty much gone around the world by this time. The, the fact that the sun never set on the English empire was already being said. They had run into India, they chewed them up. Um, they ran into China, and they had a little trouble chewing up China. Uh, they, uh, Russia was a little too big, a little too sparse, and so they just, they just sort of backed off and just sort of floated, okay? Uh, in, in the mid-19th century, England was the world power. Uh, their, their money was the uh, coin of the realm. It was the basis, the world reserve currency was backed by gold, you know, and it was doing quite well. Uh, in 1870, uh, not only did we hear today that the, uh, Germany, I mean, Germany and the United States got the silver standard, but in the 1870s, the English uh, trade deficit went, uh, trade uh, account went negative. Went negative. A um, hundred years later, 
1970, the U.S. trade deficit went negative two. 100 years later. This little 100 year thing is really sort of interesting. So now they're getting into sort of trouble, all right? And now the machine age is coming up. All those ships that the English built, they didn't, they didn't play anymore. They were having to, you know, the closer they got to the end of the century, they had, they had warships. All of a sudden, the thing that you had before, you had to throw away your calculator and buy a Mac or buy a new computer. This was a high, high, high expense. And they had the biggest navy in the world. So they really sunk themselves in the heart, okay? So the bankers, they saw it coming. These are not stupid people. They saw it coming. They're always smart. Uh, it's not working anymore. You know, we're not rolling it out anymore. So they went over to the United States. Right? Well, I want to tell you about the United States. In my writings, I have an extraordinary, profound respect for the people who started the United States of America. A respect that I didn't have in the high school when I was reading what they were doing because I didn't understand it. Now, as I see what has happened to our country, I understood why they did what they did and they said what they did. Um, Thomas Jefferson said that if we, if the United States ever allowed private bankers to issue the currency, it was over. He said private bankers were more of a threat to the, to the, to the security of the United States than standing armies. And he also didn't like standing armies. All right? That's why they have a thing in the Constitution where the military can only be funded for up to two years. They were trying to fashion a leash on the military that they'd have to keep ass coming back for money. Because he said if you have a standing military establishment, Pretty soon, you are going to spend every penny on imagined threats. And when a real threat comes, you won't have anything, any money to do with. And this is where the basis of the right to bear arms came from. It was not that you get some yobo in Texas, the right to have C4, you know, and machine guns on top of his roof. You know? It was the fact that he, they envisioned a military, a militia like they had, that the Swiss had, that when a war started, people were in the National Guard, they were trained, all of a sudden the phone calls went out, and you, you, sh you showed up and you are ready to hold off to whoever was coming at you. They didn't want an army. They didn't want a standing military force. This is what these people didn't want. Now, they also didn't want paper money. They had started their country with paper money, but they knew it was a fraud. They just knew, what else were they going to do? We don't have any money to go to war. And the boys who have the money don't want us to be independent. So they started issuing paper money, and they got them through the war, and then it collapsed. But by that time, they wrote in the Constitution about the, you know, the silver, the gold, the, the mint, stuff like that. And it's writing all over there. They're, why you need, uh, you know, they don't want the money to base. And Thomas Jefferson also was looking over at England. I mean, the Americans were a former English colony. And he saw what the paper money was doing to the English. He saw what the income tax was doing to the English. And he flat out said, if we allow the bankers, if we take their system of money into it, we're going to be working as slaves to each other, paid to hammer the chains around each other's necks. All right? Here we are, 60 hour weeks, no health care. And your boss is staying at home at the top of the CEO, what, 32 million? Or maybe 3 million. All right? While the company's going broke. Now, this all makes sense, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it all makes sense. How do they start this? They created a system whereby they issued credit in the kingdom, which is money. It's not money, though. It was credit. Credit turns into debt, compounding debt. All right? But what does money do? We all need money. We all need money. You need money to go to school. You need money to clothe yourself. You need money for everything. So these boys who gave out the money had tremendous power. And they fueled this expansion of the United States. Incredible. It produced itself. It got power and stuff like that. And these guys were making serious bank off of it. Okay? The, you know, it, it, well, they were up and down. But in England, they certainly were. When they saw the English thing going down, they decided to bring this game over to the United States. And there was a tremendous amount of resistance to it. It was basically unconstitutional. There was nothing in the United States Constitution that gave those guys the right to call in a bunch of private bankers and hand them over the keys of the kingdom and say, you print our money now, and hey, it's cool. What do you get for it? Oh, we got, I don't know, we got something. You know, uh, we don't have to print money anymore. Isn't that pretty good? They outsourced money. <laughs> okay? They outsourced money. And these guys took over the print of the money started issuing Federal Reserve debt-based paper into the American economy, and it was extraordinary. The effect on America was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary. England, 
I've always said that the English, one of the ways people describe the English as uh, uh, restraint, or at least polite, you know, they're, they're restraint. They, they, they act with restraint, they, with compunction. They're not, Americans aren't that way. Okay, they're not that way. And the English, the bankers, have managed to keep their system together for a long time because they, they constrained it. They knew it was a system. They were scamming everybody. They were, they were in advantage of it. And if you had a little scam, you best keep that little thing in, in, in pro you don't You don't want it to break down. You don't want it to screw up. You want it to keep it. You want to keep that goose, keep popping out those golden eggs. Okay? Now, they brought that goose over to America in the form of the Federal Reserve, and Americans go, wow, what a goose. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There's a goose. What does it do? Well, golden eggs. How are you going? You going like this? And then the Americans go, well, what if you squeeze it more? I mean, what if you really squeeze and got more eggs? Uh, it's really, really shouldn't do that. <laughs> you, know, you should do it. It'll screw up the goose. You know? And America had gotten this like, man, but if I got more eggs on that thing, imagine what would happen. 1913, Federal Reserve put in. Same year, is, uh, federal income tax put in the Constitution. Those two things are not disconnected. And all right. The CIA. And see, oh yeah, this is a great year for our country. <laughs> great year for our country. Um, we're almost at the centennial there, aren't we? And <clears throat> so there it is. And they start squeezing more eggs out of this goose. How do they do that? Because everybody loves money. Everybody loves credit. So they just started throwing credit into the markets. And the markets, they went bananas with this. All right. The credit markets in the United States put this money in the stock market. And that stock market took off and it exploded. It just took off. It was awesome how high it went because of the unlimited amount of credit that the bankers put into the system. And then it exploded. It fell. It collapsed. What happens? If you don't stay ahead of the game, that compounding debt will get you. All right? And you can keep it within bounds. You really can. I mean, a few people going bankrupt, you know, People out in the street losing a house, you can deal with it. You know, somebody's got to move in with somebody, and, you know, hey, hey, okay? But when you do it on a mass scale, it's real different. You do it on a mass scale, when you introduce it into, like, the, 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 uh, the stock market, or, or the uh, subprime, or the mortgage thing, it has a totally different effect. It gets huge, and it still creates compounding debt, all right? But what you've done is you've created a system where it can no longer absorb, service, pay down, or even deal with that debt. And what happened is people have lost so much money, they can't even play anymore. They, you take away their chips, and it's in shell shock, all right? One moment they thought they were rich, the next moment they owe everybody money, and there's on the street. That's what, that's what the, the Great Depression did. It brought it to a standstill. The, the, another thing that you don't realize is that we look at ex contraction, economic contraction, economic expansion, uh, as, as like breathing. Mm. What do they call it? Inhale, that's like yoga. Inhale, exhale, yeah. Expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. There was never any business cycles before capitalism. Never. never. There was no business cycles before they started printing, sucking this money out of the bank because the plasma did something that had never been done before. It had a built-in stimulant. The plasma they put in had a built-in stimulant because they, because they could do it artificially. It wasn't based on savings. It came out of a, a paper mill. It got things going a lot quicker, which is wonderful. Everybody loves the uptake. All right? But when it got things going a lot quicker, the bad side, the compounding debt, started in motion too. So what you had during the Great Depression, they brought the system to a halt. And they had put so much debt in the system, and not only brought the United States to a halt, it brought the world to a halt. The U.S. took that goose, squeezed a few more eggs out, as much as they could. There was a lot of eggs on that floor before 1929. But by the 1930s, the game was over. Everybody was in shock. Everybody was like, what the hell? They didn't know. So they passed a, law, a rule called uh, Glass-Steagall, and the, in the middle of the Depression, the Glass-Steagall said, okay, you guys can't do this thing. You really screwed up. Dude, would you look at you do that goose? All right, like, look at that goose. You know? <laughs> it's just barely breathing. You know? You, we're not going to let you do that. So what did they do? They, said, they made a law. The law said, okay, the banks, we're going to split you up. Because investment banks make money by betting. These are the boys, these are the betting boys, these are the betting boys, these are the guys that come, they're down at the table, they do this, they got this stuff. And then you got these other conservative guys, they take savers' money. Now, who are you saving? You guys are here, you're, you're part, how do you fit in the system? You people, all of us, play a very critical role in this great system. If we don't play our role, the system doesn't work. What we do is we provide the profits for the bankers. We take the debts on ourselves, either through our tax levies of the government, because the government revenues are based on loans basically coming out of the Federal Reserve that produce debt. The people are taxed to pay back the debt 
to the bankers, okay? And if you didn't work, that part wouldn't function. And that's critical. All right? And what else do you do? Well, you, you have to go and, and, and you, let's say you work hard, okay? And, and you have a, a certain amount of, like, I'm going to save for tomorrow. You know, like I, I'm coming out ahead, you know, I made a good deal. You know, that strip mall sold for a lot more. Who knew that they put in a, a Burger King across the street from it, you know? I, I'm doing really well. So you take that money. Now, before they put paper money in there, you could have put that money, which was real money, gold and silver coins, underneath your bed, and you were cool. You could, it was there. All right? You might lose interest on it, and you would, because it's not producing unless you loaned it out like a money lender. But you wouldn't lose anything on the paper. It's, it kept its value, because why? It had value. But once they got you onto the paper deal, you didn't get paid in gold and silver. You got paid in paper. Paper, we all got it in our pockets, don't we? No, we have plastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? Plastic is paper that's charging interest on it, <laughs> which is even better. Now, the, at least you got paper in your pocket, you're not paying interest on it. Now they got plastic in it, you're paying the interest on that card in your pocket. That's, that, that's really what we call a derivative. <laughs> okay? They still have that plastic stranding Oh, oh, that thing. Well, money money. Money. Yeah, you're funny. Yeah, no, we, we like oil, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, what happened is, is that as, as workers, school teachers, bus drivers, um, Whatever you do, hookers, right? <laughs> you're doing something, and you're making money, and if you could save a little bit, that's what you need to do. The game is rigged. Why is the game rigged? Why are you forced to be in this game and provided to keep on going? Because if you do nothing with that paper, it's losing value. It's losing value. All right? Because when you've got your paper, they're pretty more. Okay? They're diluting the money supply. So you're losing your you're losing value. So what you have to do is you take these pieces of paper and you go to intermediaries in the game. You go to you put it back in your pension fund. Okay? You got pension providers. You go to your bank and he gives you five percent, four percent. All right? You go to middlemen. You go to insurance. Ah, oh, I got old age coming up. I'm going to go to AIG. Ah, oh, sounds good. I got a rental one coming. Okay? And and and, and, and I'm going to get an insurance annuity. Okay? And you give them the money and they they take your money, the money that you earn. Hard earned money, okay? And you go to the bank. Okay? It's the bank. The bank, they're in the middle of it. They take your paper, your your little piece of paper, or let's say a million, you put a million bucks in, and the guy turns around the next day and he loans out ten, thirteen million dollars based on the million dollars that you gave him, and he starts charging interest on that money. That's brilliant, isn't it? That's truly brilliant. He's loaning money for taking a risk, and it's not his risk, it's not his money. All right, and and uh, you know after people distrust the banks after, after, after the FDIC, they got real nervous. They got so oh, banks gonna fail. So what happened is it's a con game. So the banks go, no, we, we can't have these people nervous. These people give us the money, and if they don't give us the money, we can't do this. We can't do that. Can't do that. So they say, okay, how are we gonna how are we keep these people cool? Well, let's give them a sticker. Where right? sticker? Where on? FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. All right. Now, how much do they pay the banks for that for the insuring your deposit base? For insuring your deposit against loss. Two cents for hundred dollars. Now, if you had a car and you wanted to insure it for the next year, and the guy's charging like two cents for every hundred bucks this week, you're going, man, this is a scam. <laughs> I mean, if I get in a wreck, how are they going to cover? You know? But it wasn't. It was just to make people feel good about putting their money in the system. The FDIC has right now less than one percent of the money to cover the deposit the bank, and there's trillions of dollars in that system. They can't cover. They cannot cover. But it served its purpose. Why? It served its purpose by making you already forced to put your money back in the system to put it in the system and feel good about it. They want you to sleep well at night. All right? Now, what do they do? The terrible thing about this is this, is that it looked like freedom, but it wasn't. Why did it look like freedom? I mean, Jefferson knew this was slavery. But what happened is, is as England was chewing up the rest of the world, the, the, it happened in Russia, it happened in China. These two huge feudal agrarian economies saw this machine coming at them and freaked. We, we got to do something about this. So they said, okay, they're going to eat us. Why? Because the British had all the money, they had all the guns, they had all the things. They come to your country, they put in the banks, they put in the businesses, and pretty soon you are just like the rest of us here. Cogs in their machine. All right? Except they had the little national thing, so they didn't want to be cogs in the English machine. They wanted their people to be cogs in their machine, probably. 
You know, they didn't like it that you weren't being forced to be cogs into the English machine. All right. So what they did, it was it was terrible because they're basically outclassed. There's too much power. So China and Russia made up this thing called communism. Uh, we're like a socialist system. Let's let's make this up. Nobody had ever done it before. You know, no one had tested to see if it worked. All right, and it didn't. All right, but with enough glue, enough guns, enough repression, they got they got it going for a while, and then it fell apart. It fell apart. Now it was a horrible thing, this thing, because you give people too much power, and I don't care under the pretext of doing good or protecting yourself, you're, the people are going to get screwed. The more power you give them, the more you're going to get screwed. That's just how it is. That's just how it is. All right. So what happens is these communists just screw the whole thing up. But you know what it did? It made the bankers look like freedom. Hey, we're free. We're free. Look at those guys on the head. You know, no, 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 no. Keep doing this. And you're free over here. Oh, we're not slaves. We're free. We're free. You're going deeper in debt. You know, screwing everybody. You know, the power's being concentrated. But what is it? You feel like you're free. Yeah, that's, that's like that FDIC thing. It's really important how you feel. All right? Now, what happened? Fortune changed. But this spread all over the world. It spread all over the world. Every country in the world now has an income tax. Every country in the world is on paper money. Every country in the world is affected by what we are doing in the U.S. Because all we are is a surrogate to the Brits. All we are is a surrogate to the Brits. The British power structure. The bankers. The city. Wall Street. The same thing. All right? And what no one would have expected is that they screwed the deal up. Well, how do they do that? They, two things happen. They did it again. They caused another Great Depression, which is just about to happen. But how they did it was ambition always brings its own end. It, no one did it to America. I mean, as much as we would like to blame the Mexicans for our present, you know, illegal, illegal immigrants for our present state of affairs, I don't think it was Jose you know, swimming across that border, you know, sending money back home that has caused the United States to be in the condition that it's in. But a lot of Americans think so, all right? What happened was this, is that after World War II, we had all that gold, all right? And, and we spent it. Why, did, how would you, why would you spend that gold? You, you could use it to anchor your money, and if you anchored the money, you could run the world. You could basically run the world if you anchored the money, because it was your money that was running the world. And you're the guy, you're paying, you just got to keep it, keep it back up, keep it together, keep it together. Okay? 1949, we had 21,775 tons of gold. We had a positive balance of trade between 1949 and 1970. We should have had more gold. Maybe by 1970, we should have had 25,000 tons of gold, maybe 30,000, I don't know. But we had a positive balance of trade. And that's all gold was used for. Gold was used between nations to balance positive and negative trade deficits. All right? Come around 1970, the United States had allegedly 8,000 tons of gold left and probably over 30,000 tons more. We'd spend it all. But we had a positive balance of trade. We had a positive balance of trade. Where did that money go? Well, it's government again. Government loves power. All of a sudden, World War II ended. And I, I can imagine how it seemed to the Americans. They looked around and Europe, oh man, those guys, they had, they lorded it over all the, all those power. They were dead, dead broke. They were stumbling around in the, in the, in the dust of World War II. You know, they were just, they were just stumbling. As far as they could see, everyone was on their knees, except the U.S. So what they did, with that 21,700 tons of gold, they created a worldwide military presence. All right? 1958, 10% of the gold went out. One year, 10% of the U.S. gold supplies went out. All right? By 1970, we had no gold there. And what else did it do? We did it by shipping, that's when we began shipping our factories overseas. It was during this time. So, and it all took money, because we had to pay people in their money, blah, blah, blah. We had no gold there. But nobody sort of knew it. All right? But the French sort of knew it, and so did the British. The Americans blamed the French for calling the gold card on us. But it was the Brits that were screwed to it. I mean, holy shit, they were at gold, we better get some. All right? 1970, the, the calls for the gold started coming in. We said, no more gold, we're bankrupt. And all of a sudden, that gold and silver that lay at the heart of the golden goose, that truly lay at the heart of the golden goose, was gone. We still have the goose. We don't have the gold and silver that was at the heart of the golden goose. 
And what the professor has said is that what we're paying now is for what happened in 1971, 72. All right? All that was was the moment it became obvious, the moment we had to close the door. We couldn't do it. But the gold and silver was gone. Once the gold and silver was gone, then it didn't matter, and we didn't have to, we didn't have to make good on any deficit. All right? Before, we had to make good on deficits. We bought more, and we were supposed to hand you more gold and more paper. It didn't matter. We were just hanging out paper like it was running out of style. All right? And we've done it. Now, what happened between 1950 and now? This is why we're in such a terrible shape. Late stage capitalism is a. Why do bankers do banking? Profit. As a byproduct, you have enterprise, you have debt, you have all these things as a product of business. But the, what the bankers want is profit. They don't care how they get it or what they do. We, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, it's just it's sad what happened to our country. It's really sad, you know? And, 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 and at the end of late stage, what I call late stage capitalism, late stage capital markets, late stage credit, late stage play money, is that the ones who are closest to the spigot have the advantage. The further you are away from either of these, the lower you are on the scale and, and the less you're able to, to get around. All right? The cl farther away, closer you are at the top, the, ma the more you're able to leverage your way in the system and take advantage of everybody who can't have that kind of advantage. So this is what happened in the United States. Um, just recently, there's a company called Linens and Things, and they just went bankrupt. Right? Um, they were sold in, this is 2000, and this is 2008, 2006, and um, I think uh, February, 2006, Linens and Things, okay, Linens and Things, okay, owed its debt for its company. They were a retail store in the United States, owed, I think, uh, $2.8 million. Okay? That was their corporate debt. All right? Um, this month, Linens and Things, and then they were bought in 2006 by Apollo uh, Capital. Uh, equity firm. Okay? They bought them for $2.8 million. This month, Linens of Things has declared bankruptcy. Alright, they're out of business. People are going to get fired. The leases that they have signed at, at shopping centers are going to get cut. Alright? Um, we may have to drive the next couple of blocks to buy the sheets we wanted. It's a big deal. But the company's open. Mm -hmm. When linen things went down and put it on their balance sheet, this is how much they owed in debt. $885 million. Two years. Two years. That's what we've done to America. Or can I say, that's what's been done to America. It's been done to it at the corporate level. It's been done to it at the government level. It's been done to it at every level that they can and to make a way and get above it. The state of California just went and said Goldman Sachs, which handled the sale of their bonds, handled the sale of the state of California, which is a big customer for Goldman Sachs, said Goldman Sachs went and told its institutional customers to bet against the bonds, which should drive up the cost of the bonds, of the interest rates. Nice people. <laughs> now, all they want is profit. And they have profited. But they killed the goose. They've killed the goose. Just destroyed cancer. Yes, it's a cancer. It's a blood cancer. It really is what they did was a blood cancer. Because it still went circulating in the body, it still went to the brain, it still went to the muscles, it still went to the legs, it still went to every aspect of commerce. But there was a cancer in it. Alright? And we reached a point where the cancer is now virulent in the body and everywhere. That's why we are at the end game. That's why we're here today. That's why you guys came. That's why we're here to talk about this. That's why Tom is sitting there looking at numbers and he's going crazy. That's why Braun is sitting there taking more orders than he thought, you know. That's why we're here. Because it started back there. Nothing changed except it advanced. What advanced? The disease. The disease of debt-based money creating more debt. The disease of irredeemable paper that can't be paid back and is now found out to be wanting. I mean, that paper was no better five years ago than it is today. 
Except today, people won't take it. It's a con game. It's a confidence game. This is it. This is it. And if you don't call it a confidence game, it's not a confidence. It's called economics. They teach in schools. <laughs> in very prestigious organizations. They hand out doctorates on this thing. All right? But this is what it is. And and that's the that's the deal. We're in the end game. And I don't know what else to say about it except here we are. I wish you the best of luck. And um, gold and silver, that's why gold and silver is important, because it was what they took out of it in the very beginning. They took it out of it in the very beginning. And now on our own, in our little way, in whatever way we can, we're out trying to get a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver. Now we, have, now we float up the coin shop and they don't in the United States. They can't get us the silver and we're sort of freaking out about that. You know, but we're in our way because somehow intuitively those of us in this room have seen with a hook of my crook, holy smokes, this doesn't smell right. Something's going on, okay? And it was going on, and it is going on, and nobody believed us until it started flying apart. I mean, what the professor said for years was true then. It didn't take the collapse of the economy to make him right. What it took was the collapse of the economy to make people listen to him. That's what it is. And so, here we are. It all makes sense, unfortunately. Daryl, yes. they're bright, they're not stupid. So they, <clears throat> they knew what they were doing. So what is the end game after that? They're yeah. taking it to a point deliberately. So what comes? Okay. My, my, this, this, is, this is where we are. Because it, these boys are very powerful. They, have, they own the governments, and, and they let you... I don't like getting political. And I know that every time somebody puts up a placard, it means something, whether you're on the conservative or liberal side. And it does mean something. Every one of those placards has a meaning. Physical conservatism, taking care of people, we're all, we're all whatever they are. And I think you should believe these things. I, should, I think you should go out and, and talk with people about them, you know, and have a dialogue. And, and if you want to have an army, you agree on it and pay for it. Or if you want to go out and have child care, go out and pay for it. But at least agree on it. And at least know where the money's going to come from. But what they've done is that they've gotten everybody, on the right and the left, just to think this is a free will. Why? Because the money is right there, you pay for it on the backside, and ultimately it'll kill you. But it ain't going to kill you. You know it's going to kill your kids. So there's, no, there's no future. The future's gone. It's in mortgage. It's all over. Now, where do we go from here? This is where my, my sense is. Because we all have our own points of view. I am a very hopeful person. I know it doesn't sound like it. Right? <laughs> but I am. I'm truly hopeful. I have looked disaster in the eye. And with the myopia God has given me, I have found hope. All right? <laughs> and I have come to the conclusion that we are at the end of an extraordinary system. This system that Scott set in motion in 1694 has brought us to Australia. I'm crying at languages. I can speak English and go almost anywhere and have somebody understand me. You know? I mean, it's personally benefited me. There's many things have come out of this. We've, we've learned, we've grown together as a, as a people. We have these little machines where people over here here. Many things have happened. Many, many positive things have happened. All right? But humanity, which is what we're part of, has reached the end of this game. The end game is not only the resolution, in my belief, of economic imbalances, of financial problems, of ecological mistakes, of bad choices. It's the end of the game that has brought us here. But that doesn't mean there's not a new game coming. All right? I believe there's a new game coming. And I believe these boys who have been running this game are going to be real surprised. At least that's my hope. That's my hope. They're going to be real surprised. They're not the smartest boys in the block. All right? They got caught out of pocket on this one. All right? And some of them knew it was coming, but a lot of them didn't. The hedge funds, Carlisle, you know, Blackstone, these, they didn't intend to take beatings. They didn't intend to have a hedge fund. They didn't intend this. It's getting away from them. All right? My sense is this. We are at the end of the most extraordinary era that humanity has lived through. It's brought us, you know, material gain beyond comprehension. You know? I mean, when I'm in the airplane and I'm in the toilet, 30,000 feet, I'm struck. How extraordinary is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Think of that. This is extraordinary. You know? 
I mean, I it almost stuns me. Just wow. This is like, you know, no breeze, you know. <laughs> I mean, here I am, you know, and doors closed, and, you know. And, wait, this is a miracle. <laughs> All right? This is a miracle. What I'm saying here is that the miracle is not going to end. The miracle is going to transform. We are a part of the miracle itself. And, and, and I know this is going to be real because you can't transfer thought to other people. You can't transfer. I can't make And I don't want you to believe this because I'm saying it. I don't want you to believe it. That's what got us in trouble in the first place. People going around believing what somebody else said. All right? Because if you, if you at least disbelieve the truth until it becomes the truth, then it's your truth. If you believe the truth before it becomes your truth, you believe it's a lie. It's a lie. And that's what happened. They lied to us. And no one thought about it. All we were trying to do is take the kids to school, you know, take care of mom, doing this. And these guys here, and these guys there, were thinking about something else. All right? And we let it go. We let it go. It's too late. We can't get it back. It's going to go off the cliff. All right? But perhaps through this experience, we're going to, there's enough of us. You know, they, the funny thing they said about the American Revolution. You know, this, let, let me go back. Jesus, laid up in the cross, every, all these Christians, oh, man, poor guy. You know, I, you know, look at this horrible thing that happened. And every bo Christian down there thinks, you know, if I was there, I was there, I'd be out there. Why did this be? The truth of the matter is, most of them wouldn't have been there. Most of them would have been like, oh, here's the crucifixion coming up. Well, no. <laughs> Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> you know? In retrospect, they like to think they're noble, smart, compassionate. No. These people. All right? So the thing is, is that this new age is coming. And if I'm going to give you anything that I want to leave, it's just my belief. You just take it on my belief. But at least that, that there, that there is, is, it's bigger than us. And it doesn't matter what we believe. It's like the money system. It doesn't really matter what we believe about it. It is what it is. And so it is with life itself. We have many views about this, and most of them are wrong. All right, We've got these distorted things that we were told, and we believe them. Because what else are you going to believe? What you were told. All right? But I, my feeling is that this is an extraordinary thing that we were part of. Not only is it a miracle that you can sit on a toilet at 30,000 feet, and there's toilet paper and that little thing, and you get up and everybody's smiling at you, and you sit down and you see it. It's all right. That's a miracle. But this is a miracle, too. And so are you. We're all miracles. The people you're next to are miracles. The people who are suffering through this are miracles. And it's through the sacredness of the miracle that we're a part of that we may remember as we're going to go through a very intense time. So, I am dark. I never said this is going to be easy. I mean, in the front of my book, I took out a page of my book. I took it out. I, I wrote this book, and I wrote a page, an introduction, and I took it out. Because it was written in sort of black patois, you know, Mark Twain, you know, race has got a lot of charge on it. But what it said was this. It, it, it was like the, 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 the slave in, in, you know, in Huckleberry Finn. And he goes, it, a black guy, Missy, Missy, Missy. So what, Jim? I seen it. I seen it. I, I seen the promised land. She said, what's it like? It's beautiful. It was more beautiful than anything I'd ever seen. Beautiful. I seen it. It's beautiful. He said, well, why are you so worried? He said, because between us and the promised land is the River Jordan. And the River Jordan's running high. It's never run this high. I'm afraid. I don't know if we can make it across. But I've seen the promised land. And that's, and I took it out. Because I'm not saying how we're going to make it across. We're going to make it across out of necessity. That's it. I made it through life out of necessity. All right? That's how we get from one day to the next. We're impelled. Something innocent impels us. It's going to impel us to the other side. It's not going to be easy. But my sense is, at least I'm hoping for it, it's the promised land. So, there you go. Oh, anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I do as good as Braun. But uh, if nobody has any, I understand that too. So it's like I don't take this stuff personal. Yeah? The rationale for going back to the gold standard has been that it will impose discipline yeah. on it. But the fact of the matter is that there were probably more financial crises in the 19th century when every government was on the gold standard. And there have been 20. 
Um, I'm going to give this to the professor. Well, then you have to the question. Okay, I will repeat the question. Because uh, this is, this is, okay. he said that if we, the, 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 the value of the gold standard, if we're going to return to the gold standard, all right, our experience of the gold standard would, during the 19th century was that we had all these financial problems during the time when we had the gold standard. So, we so he said, well, how's that the solution? There are more problems on There's the more gold problems. standard yeah, than not. Mm -hmm. than, yeah. than without it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I said that perhaps, or, you know, the question is that it implies that there may have been more problems under the gold standard, or at least more financial crises. So how does that well, play? More, fre more frequent. Or more, fr okay, more frequent, right, okay. No. Let me just point out to you that the United States Constitution is a marvelous document. And in spite of all what you've said about the bankers and so on, the American Constitution could have given us a, 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 a decent world, a decent economy, a decent financial system, and also a decent banking, because there is such a thing sure. as a decent banking. So my answer is that I want to look at the gold standard as an adjunct to the Constitution. The Constitution provides for elections, elections every second year, every fourth year, or in the case of the Senate, every sixth uh, year, in the case of an individual senator. <coughs> but the gold standard gives you a system where you cast your vote every single day, and the ballot is not made of paper, it's made of gold, it's the gold coin, and if you spend it, it's a vote. If you don't spend it, it's also a vote. When you spend it, you vote in favor of the producer who produced the good which you thought was worthy of buying. If you don't spend it, you vote against the producers and you say I'm going to save until another a better producer comes along. So my answer to the question is never look at the gold standard in isolation. It's just uh, a tool. But when you combine it with something such as the Constitution of the United States I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the Constitution of Australia, so I can't pass a judgment on that. But I do admire the Constitution of the United States, and the more it's being violated day in, day out, the more I admire it. I, yeah, I mean, I can second that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, would, I would just maybe add that you know, perhaps there are more frequent crises, but uh, were they caused by the gold standard or perhaps there were other things? And had we been on a fiat standard, perhaps they would have been even worse. So we well, uh, uh, were uh, able uh, to make that comparison. I mean, you can't raise that question. It's so obvious. That the f f I well, mean, okay, I'm playing the devil's advocate, I suppose, to some extent, you not can, knowing for you sure. You can the two uh, <laughs> on the same day or in the same sentence. I was simply, yeah, okay, okay granted, okay, <laughs> might come up with this, but, you know, simply put is that, you know, the gold standard, you know, you have to have the cause and effect. Was the gold standard causing it, or perhaps these crises were going to happen regardless, and was in fact the gold standard what uh, made these crises uh, less likely to cause a total collapse? Obviously, the U.S. did not totally collapse, uh, but, you know, uh, on the fiat system, uh, we can't pass that judgment yet. Uh, <laughs> so. uh, Philip is going to distribute uh, some printed material. These are my earlier writings, and in one of them you will find what I call the revisionist 
theory of the Great Depression, where I do prove that the propaganda according to which the gold standard caused the depression is absolute nonsense. In, on the contrary, it was the violation, the sabotaging of the gold standard, which was responsible for the um, uh, Great Depression. And the proof is just unfolding before our eyes. Because up to now, the propaganda was that these things can never happen again. Massive bankruptcies, massive unemployment, and um, all those things which hit the world so unexpectedly during the Great Depression. We have now a wonderful government-managed system, fine-tuning of the economy, fine-tuning of, uh, de- of the demand, and so on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that propaganda has been thoroughly discredited by the, the events. Now we don't have a gold standard, and we have a depression which is going to be probably far worse than the in the 1930s. So I'm offering uh, these papers to you. Uh, I hope you can uh, take them with you and read it at your leisure and uh, just make your own conclusion that anti-gold propaganda, anti-gold standard propaganda is just a bunch of lies. Could I just clarify something there, Antel? Um, because of the size of the documents that um, Professor Beckett has given me, I uh, spoke with Marcus and we're going to actually scan them in, put them into a PDF format and email them to you. It really is it's going to be, end up quite a large document. I haven't had a chance All to right, that, but, oh, but you will have access to it and I hope, yeah. Thank you. Nathan? Can I just uh, add uh, my comment to that issue about uh, there being more uh, crises uh, during the 19th century? Uh, My limited knowledge of the banking history then is that it was actually a story of an attempt to get a Federal Reserve formed, and that I I believe it was during the presidency of uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, where he was resisting, I think it was the second bank of the United States, and it was as that bank attempted to play uh, chicken with uh, President Jackson that America suffered one of its worst crises because the bank attempted to say, we're much too important for you to shut us down, uh, we will cause a recession, look what will happen if you do, and, and President Jackson did not blink, I understand uh, the history was, and temporarily the United States kept a, uh, I mean there's other people that know the story far better than me, but I would just yeah. make that point that good. I think a lot of the, a lot of the yeah. difficulties were the attempt of the bankers to assert themselves again. So they could get that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thank you, Nick. Yes. Um, I asked this question before, um, or two questions. Firstly, when? <laughs> when? And secondly, what, at a personal level, what can you do about it? Uh, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take refuge in the professor's uh, uh, answer to Nathan's question the first day when he asked him, "What do you do? You stand by the original um, uh, prediction in ten years?" And I'll say, "No, it's happening sooner than I thought yesterday." We, I can't tell. The, you know, the, it's, it's like, it's, it's closer and closer and closer. And I have discussions with people all the time about when is it going to happen. And, and what I do notice is that lots of times people have an agenda of why they want it to happen longer. You know, they've got a real good, you know, program in place to take advantage of this. And so they like to have it stretched out a little. Other people who are just totally freaked out think they were on their way and it should have happened a couple of years ago. And it, and it well could have. And so because it could have happened before and it hasn't happened yet, we're somewhere in the middle between yesterday and tomorrow. And that goes out. So I cannot say. They, these people have an extremely amount of power, long legs, all right. But it's 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 as as the professor pointed out, it's happening even quicker than he thought. It's just going like that. So we don't know what the thing is. The personal thing is gold and silver. 
as always, as always, as always. Because the cause of the problem was when they took gold and silver out of the money and gave us paper. So it, it, only in a financial sense, all right? We're taking a beating in junior goals, the leverage is not, you know, and they're like that. But I, I'm a firm believer that, that that's a palliative to the problem that they caused. That if you can put a little aside, that, that you do that. You know, and the rest of surviving the tough times, well, I always tell people that Martha and I are looking for friends who can grow things, who have a nice house and won't mind a couple of or <laughs> <laughs> would be considered non productive under those circumstances. Sean A's done. I'd just make a very quick comment yeah, yeah. to the gentleman who just asked the question when. Last year in Somber Day, uh, I did my own little survey people there and I spoke to each of the people there sometimes in a group, sometimes individually and asked them when they thought this situation was going to break and um, one of the guys said he thought 12 months and to the public's perception not, not the February that Andrew was talking about but to the public's perception precisely 12 months later it broke and I thought well so if you want your question answered I suggest you ask Nathan because that's what he told me 12 months <laughs> <laughs> so when is it, Mike? <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah, that was very good, very good. It's, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's a it's process, it. right? So it's not an event. It's many events that are layered together in a chain. And if you want my humble opinion, I think we're about at the end of the beginning. Or the beginning of the end. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, not, no. The, not the beginning of the end. Okay. That's out in the future. I, th I think the things are in place now that constitute pretty much the begin the end of the beginning stage of this. Okay, starting back with uh, Frank and Tarp and uh, yeah. things like that. And now we'll have to see how it plays out before you get to the very end stages. And it may take six months, it may take uh, two years, it may take two months. You can't predict that. Yeah, there was a guy... It's underway. It's underway. There was a, a, one of the best, really a very, very good writer on the web. Uh, I think his name is Sadi Jat Das or something like that. He's an expert in derivatives. He wrote a book and they said he wrote a, a piece on derivatives. It was 4,000 pages. <laughs> All right? So he, he knew it. All right, he was there at the beginning, he understood it, and he understood where the weak points are. So last year somebody called him up and he said, and he was a journalist, because he, he knew this guy knew more than he did, and he said, well, where do you think we are? And he said, oh, um, uh, at the beginning, the end, are we in the second inning, we're in the seventh inning, which is exactly what the question being raised here is, where are we? And he said, they're not finished singing the anthem. <laughs> you know, we're just in the, all in the ballpark now, and the anthem is still being sung, there are people still going to the bathroom, and they haven't taken their seats, and it hasn't really started. And this is his perception because of, the, you know, of, of how he saw what we've created. So, but like I say, it's purely, <coughs> we, we, can't, we all can guess. And, and, and we all. And, and, and here, you know, the only advice, and I think it's, it's, it's the thing that you, we're all responsible for ourselves and our families and, and our loved ones. And, and, we, and, and that's why it's good to have a, this is a wonderful forum here for us to get together and exchange ideas and feelings because I, I think we share many, many assumptions and, and, and bit, pieces of us have more truths than other. And I wasn't quite sure that Nathan was the guy then, but I didn't know he had asked him. And now I know that Nathan is the guy. But in the sense that you find out these things and, and by more than yourself, you can form opinions. By ourselves, you may be right, but you may not know it. And with other people, I think we'll get a sense, we're gonna get this through, we'll get through this thing together. And, and I think that's where the, the, this, we're going to be forced to go there. So, you know. I suppose yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, or well, hoping that the basis, if you imagine the Titanic and the level of water rising, the third class passengers saw the water rising first because they were closest to the water. I'm hoping the basis would be the equivalent of a, of a measure of when we're going to go under. We're hoping when that too. Will go under. Yeah. Or the point of when it will that may be more than hope. Do you want to speak to us about this hope? Or? I would like to ask Tom if he could, in two or three minutes, explain his teaser. What, ha what happened is that we couldn't ac accommodate his topic in this program in its entirety, because in a way it's open-ended. 
So what we decided that we'll just steal a little bit of time at the end of tomorrow's afternoon session and maybe also some on Friday, not at the end, but but this would be voluntary more or less because you might feel that it's too much of a good thing. So. Uh, Tom has to make a little propaganda for his teaser. <laughs> but I, I, I would like you to explain. I don't mean this, the teaser, and when I said that to you, I didn't mean it in terms of some sort of, you know, I'm trying to get something out of this. Um, uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, um, there's one piece of this that actually I kind of thought through as we've been um, uh, talking the past couple of days and sort of developed. Uh, almost a theory for why uh, we're in the situation right now of going potentially into backwardation and why perhaps it isn't maybe the last contango but it is something that may be akin to a rehearsal. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I've actually drawn this out to determine how I would be able to explain this and so this is essentially it. <laughs> And so, my challenge here somehow take this and <laughs> put it up on a board and explain it to you. And, and my estimate of how long it would really take to do a, a fair job of doing it is about three to four hours. Um, and so right now, I don't know, you know, what, what people's sort of threshold for pain would be. I could, I could maybe break this up into little pieces, and perhaps if people are interested, I can go into more details, you know, in the future, either on my quote blog or as part of my service or whatever, but um, I guess I just wanted to get a sense as to, you know, what I, what I could do because this is a, I think it's actually a, a it, it, it involves the basis at sort of a level that um, really few people really get to look at, but it explains essentially the whole history of how the um, central bank leasing that started in the late 80s into the 90s and the mine hedging or forward selling that Barrick was the uh, sort of uh, inventor of, but a lot of mining companies uh, followed, was sort of a, a dance between these, the, the, the central banks and, and, and the mines, and how that depressed the gold price, but didn't depress it actually as much as it could have. But the fact is now that, in, uh, the we know this, that the mines have pretty much bought back most of these forwards, and you know, many analysts believe, and I happen to also, that that was one of the reasons why the gold price has increased uh, in, in the last few years. But it's actually interesting that the central banks have not called back the leases. Um, and uh, when I go through this explanation, if, if I do it now or later, uh, it it's becomes pretty clear, I think. It is now in my mind, although <laughs> it remains to be seen whether I can make it clear to anyone else that there is a very powerful sort of uh, effect of having the um, hedging that the mines were doing and the central bank leasing happening together bilaterally in effect uh, on the one hand and sort of the unwinding of these two things happening unilaterally in that the mines have bought back these hedges, but the central banks have not called these in these leases. Um, and I believe that uh, it actually in September this year is when this whole sort of a, a secondary part of it, the central banks calling in the leases. And I'm not even sure it's really the central banks themselves doing it as a forceful act or really the people that are leasing it are sort of voluntarily returning this gold or perhaps in combination and maybe even the bullion banks are involved but I think this has started in September of this year and uh, my belief and again this is something I've just kind of developed in the last couple of days here thinking through this and doing some research on the internet while <laughs> surreptitiously while some of these discussions were happening that I think this is actually a, a perhaps a very powerful force beyond sort of just the you know the retail investment demand uh, beyond uh, almost anything else that people have been talking about in terms of what might be the next drivers for the gold price to increase, maybe this hyperinflation expectation or you know monetary instability or people coming back out of bonds and the dollar going down. Um, and in fact, this could very well be the, the most powerful force 
um, in, in, um, in what happens to the gold price perhaps in the next couple of years and, and, and maybe even irrespective of how quickly the this when occurs. Um, if it's not the uh, so that gold mines who who have the least gold, who who does? I mean, you say the leases haven't been called yet. In other words, the least gold is still out there. But right. in whose hands is this? Who owes that? Who whose debt is that least gold? Bullion banks. Well, that's one question, but I think the bullion banks are certainly a large portion of it. But of course, bullion banks do not, you know, as the Perth Mint does not want to have necessarily price uh, exposure. Uh, I think the bullion banks generally, uh, there's there certainly have trading desks that want to take directional bet, but in general, they don't want to have price exposure. So that is a valid question. Who who holds the end of the stick? Uh, oh, and yeah. I, there have been lots of bank failures, including investment banks and some commercial banks. We haven't heard yet a failed bullion bank. Is it possible that the, the, the bullion banks are also dead man walking, but the central banks do not call their least gold because they don't want the public to know that the bullion banks are just as dead as some of the uh, investment banks? I think that's certainly possible, but I think maybe another possibility is that the that the uh, there's a larger goal of the central banks to sort of save what can be redeemed and not allow one aspect of a bullion bank operation to take down the entire system. And perhaps, you know, I'm not saying that the six to perhaps 20,000 tons of gold, depending on who you believe, that's been leased which is roughly anywhere between three to eight times the annual mine output would be called in in the course of a week or two. But well, you know, there has so far, year, or mean. even a course of a year. But 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 it's such a large amount that that even just a fractional amount of this being called in would be by far the largest yeah. uh, price driving influence. Um, by, fa by ma orders of magnitude compared to almost anything else that I could imagine taking place in the next few months to years. But only if the, but only if the bullion banks don't have it anymore and have to step into mm. the market and buy it. That's what you're implying, right? That they're not actually sitting on it in a, in a hoard. But uh, which would be simple. To I can assure you that. Yeah, yeah, they, sure. They did just. <laughs> they're, park not, they're not. The yeah. is they're not. Yeah. Someone, yeah. someone has the physical gold yeah. someplace. They, they might have sold it out into the yeah. market. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, That's why I describe it as a process of unwinding. It's not necessarily, you know, it's not trying to come up with new gold from anywhere. It's unwinding, coaxing the gold back out of whoever is now holding it um, because that's the only way they're going to be able to get it back and deliver it to the central banks. So, so because they don't because they don't actually hold them, then that's going to have a positive uh, impact on the price. Because they'll have to, uh, In effect, this would be yeah, it would be spot buying buying gold in the spot market to deliver it back to the central banks. And that's that's not going to work. No, well, it's not going to work. But but again, uh, they're not going to be able to, to return six to twenty thousand tons. They may never. They may never. Well, therefore, the writing is on the wall that the bullion banks are going to default. Be, even if they, they have their even if they have the gold in their hands, they are not going to release it or give it back. They just declare bankruptcy and take the consequences, and then then run with the gold. <laughs> <laughs> Now, here's the interesting part, though. That's okay. what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Okay, so if you say that, then, then let's, let's now name who these bullion banks are. Uh, yeah. We're yeah. talking yeah. about JP, JP Morgan, Morgan yeah. JP Citibank, Morgan. Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Bank, Bank. Uh, uh, HSBC, but primarily yeah. JP Morgan, yeah. Yeah. Bank of America, yeah. Citibank, yeah, Goldman Sachs, who are now bank holding companies. Yeah. Yeah. Bank these are, no, but, but yeah, to some degree, but I think I've named probably 90%. So, so really, yeah, to some extent, but I don't think they're as actually involved in the leasing side of things. But, um, so what we just named essentially the banks that, that have been buying the other banks that are failing and who are the favored sort of, you know, last men standing of the 
central banks. So, so I agree with you that perhaps they could just go bankrupt, but I don't think that the central banks can afford to let them go bankrupt. Unless they want and to. Unless they want to, or unless they nationalize them. Now, perhaps, yeah. you know, maybe what the answer is, you just nationalize yeah. it and then cancel and, out and the loan. Absolutely. You know, they, they have powers. But, but here's the problem. There's still then the central banks sh being short this gold. So there's still a counterparty out there that's accountable. Mm. So just because the bullion banks were to go bankrupt doesn't mean doesn't make all of the bullion banks own counterparties no longer accountable for these essentially derivative transactions. So one way or another, um, I would posit that that and, and I would be willing to to say that perhaps only five or six hundred tons or ten percent of the low end of this number would be enough to make the pain so you know excruciating that uh, in effect it would have to be stopped. Now whether it's the, you know all the banks being nationalized or not. But, but, yeah, but, know, but this is beside the point because th don't <laughs> expect that they will find the gold in sitting in the vault of those bullion banks. They are smart enough to spirit out the gold and give it to their counterparties so that uh, they can share the loot after the storm yeah. has blown we'll over. Well, I think that's already happened. It's already happened. So, so the bullion banks don't have that that's decision right. making. That they, they are not do. going. All to they can do is make a make a meager attempt to undo this. But I think that meager attempt alone is enough to 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 create the crisis by itself. Well, you just talk. They crash the system because they have the gold. Who that's has the gold? It's in their interest. Who has the gold? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So who's that I think that's the question of the day. Who's, who's the goal? Who's in possession? Possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> Braun, he's got it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's also the goal. Well, um, I mean, understand that you know central banks. Uh, you know the mentality is I've got this gold, I want to earn a return, so they lease it out. But they don't lease it directly. They just say to the bullion bank, I'll give you this amount of metal. You will pay me an interest rate, and then they let the bullion bank deal with who they're giving it to. Sure. Mm. And mm. there are only two legitimate uses for lease metal. The first one sort of I talked about, it's to fund a jeweler or a manufacturer who needs metal for their operation. Now that's a non-risk business because you know the physical gold is in the operations. So that lease is covered safe, and yeah. apart from you know bankruptcy and someone walking away and stealing the gold, that's safe. The only other use for it is to sell it forward, to sell it. And yeah, so I guess short. But, but. Now the question is do the central banks, when they gave it to the bullion banks, did they just give it to the bullion banks and go, you're AAA rated, you know, we trust that you are fiduciarily, responsibly watching out who you've given it to and what they're doing with it? Are they, do they know? I don't think they do. I think they just go, JP Morgan, HSBC, you are trustworthy banks, you, you've got prudential requirements, you know. I'm, I'm a, and remember, a lot of these decisions in central banks are also done by some sort of whiz kid who studied financial stuff and thinks, yeah, all risk management stuff's in place and you've got things to cover it. Are the bullion banks, the question is, the bullion banks don't have it. They're, not, they're sort of similar to the warehouse trader and the Perth Mint and manufacturers. They don't really necessarily care about the price. They just want to on sell it, lend it out to someone else who's short sell it. The question is, do they done that. their credit checks and their counterparty exposure properly? Have they got collateral in cash against that? Are they marking to market the short position of whoever you know they've leased it to who short sold it? Right. That's the question. Or are they also stupid enough to just go and say, right, I gave it to Barrick and Barrick short sold it, but Barrick's a good credit risk. It all is a question of have they actually got collateral and the real cover against the positions, or are they just all relying on credit ratings and credit worthiness of these counterparties? It's the lucky person the one at the end of the chain who got it. Uh, they aren't going to give it back. It's because it's been short sold. Yeah, I mean, if it has been short sold, which most of it must have been. Well, nobody has mentioned, but could it be that some of that gold is actually part of the derivative monster? No. Or, or, think, or, the, the, or the insurance against these leases? Because probably there is also an insurance. Because, because you see, the point in, of this derivative monster is that there is no clearinghouse and there's no paper trail. 
the gold has been sold and sold and sold perhaps a million times and there's just no way to track it down where it is because it's spinning so fast and I that's all yeah. I mean remember and we might get out of it but all all derivatives in gold have to be based ultimately from least metal. At least metal, that initial ability to yeah. borrow metal and then do something yeah. with it allows them to construct forwards, options, yeah. all of those transactions. Yeah. But it means that the person constructing that financial instrument, a derivative, has to get rid of that gold, yeah. convert into cash, and so on and so forth. So they don't hold that gold. That gold's been sold on to the end investor, the person who really wanted that physical metal. But I think the cash for all these people who created these derivatives is they're all relying on portfolio theory, they're all relying on, on standard normal market operations to do the risk assessment on these derivatives. When they use the Black-Scholes method, it assumes a standard distribution of returns and risk. They don't, and which just says that 98% of all, all events occur within three standard deviations. What happens when you get 10 standard deviations, which is what we see? Black Swan bottle. Exactly, they all break down their so-called risk management to say, okay, I've got a forward to do and I've covered it with this option and all, that all breaks down and you because what you ultimately end up left with is counterparty risk. And I don't think that a lot of these transactions between they're all based on trust and counterparty assessments of these other entities. Right. I, I think quick, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, a good point, but but I think even beyond that and taking that sort of a step further, you know, what allowed in effect some of the hedging to occur at at, at you know uh, by the mines is the central bank leasing and, and, and vice versa. But now what you've done is, so those two were sort of a uh, synergistic relationship and this is what I would explain. You know. um, but um, what's happened now is this one side of that has been kicked out. All the, all the mines have bought back these four sales. So you've essentially created almost an end game in itself. Now we can argue what the bullion banks might do sort of, you know, illicitly, you know, but but I'm going to try to do this from, a, from a, a perspective that doesn't take that into account and simply says, practically speaking, on the margin, when something starts, you know, they're typically, you know, not the end game intentions of people to steal. You know, people generally try to, you know, do as much as the right thing as they can, given that they don't want to go to jail, you know, if they can avoid it. It's only when you're really, you know, at the very end there do people really, you know, now maybe we have different opinions. These opinion guys on this, don't go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI is investigating. I don't know if you've read the, you know. But John uh, Mack got let off completely. The, the, John Mack, the head of Morgan Stanley, was being investigated by the SEC enforcement officer on collusion, on, you know, on, on all that kind of stuff, and, and, the, and the person got fired. And, and uh, for doing that, for investigating it, and they just went and they cleared the administrative officer for firing the investigator. And there's no accountability. There's no, they own it. But there is still a golden handshake. <laughs> gold? It's platinum these days. <laughs> yeah. Could I mention something? Yes. Could I suggest all the bullion banks goes as already in our, all of us possession, <laughs> the public. Because they've been selling it. Right. Yeah. Uh, because also, I think if you study the CPM yearbook, and you find statistics there, how much is owned by the public and how much is being sold by the central bank. If you look through your statistics, you can see how much gold was ever produced, right. and how much is in the central bank, and how much is owned by you and Professor Finnegan. Okay. <laughs> but and, and the Arabs. Hmm? And the Arabs. And the Arabs, and if the you, Indians, and are the Chinese, and I have a little bit of it. But <laughs> 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 if you break it down further, you and me, you know, sort of the, the yes. aren't exactly the same as as the Rothschilds or the, you know, or, or you know, some of the, you know, the Arabs or as I don't say it in that terms, but you know, the there's a totally different. There, there's retail buying. And then there's the whole, you know, the, the, the retail buying is largely reportable because we know how much the department generally produces, yes. you know, how much there is of the retail stuff. We really don't know what happens on the wholesale market. We know roughly what mine production is, and but you have to guess at almost everything else. <coughs> so, and, and so we don't even know how much is being held by <coughs> whom uh, from that perspective. <coughs> so, I, you know, I would beg to differ just a little bit in that, that in fact, you know, maybe we don't take that much comfort that we know who, that it's just us because that us is, you know, that there's a lot of us's in the us. <laughs> um, well, let me just uh, tell you a little true story which might uh, 
to shed light on what the central <coughs> banks may do to cover this lost gold on their books. During World War II, the United States still had silver certificates. In fact, the $1 bills and the $5 bills and maybe even some $10 bills were not Federal Reserve notes in those years during World War II. They were silver certificates and they were had to print more and more to finance the war and the industries producing for the war. So there was not enough silver to back them. So what did the government of the United States do? And, and I can document this because I did the research and I have the documentation. They included silver built into warships and, uh, and the battleships which were sent in harm's way. You must understand there's a lot of silver in those warships because all the electric system uh, uh, involved silver. So they just put that silver and said this is the backing for the silver certificates in the hands of the people. They could have used the caps and the silver and the sailors' teeth. Because <laughs> you know? they're in the service of the Navy at the time. I can give you the statistics. So uh, the government has the power to say that okay this gold is lost but we print something and put it in place so that the auditors and the bookkeepers and so on can balance their books. And they will balance their books. Don't uh, kid yourself that they'll <laughs> feel any loss over that. <laughs> yes. Um, about a year ago, the, there were a lot of zinc contracts outstanding, and the London Metals Exchange said that they didn't have to be on it because at that stage they couldn't be, they couldn't bring the actual physical. I think it was in zinc. Nickel. Yeah. Nickel was it? Yes. They couldn't bring physical nickel to the table. They couldn't honour the contract. And I don't know what happened in the end. But at the time, I think it was December. There were just no contracts on it. They could just ignore them. Yeah. So they perhaps you just ignore it. You could do this. And in that particular case, you know, you might argue that since one party held 90% of the contracts, you know, someone might have felt that perhaps that was an attempt at corner. But, you know, certainly, you know, uh, this is an example of, of bending the rules to suit your needs. Same thing with the Hunt brothers, obviously. Palladium in 1998-99, they went to basically um, you know, the margins are typically uh, uh, measured by the amount of volatility, daily volatility, and the price of the futures, because it takes about a day for a margin call to happen. So, if you if the margin is too small based on daily volatility, you could have someone that 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 loses so much that in fact they can't raise the money; they go bankrupt. So, what they did in Palladium, though, is that they raised the margin to 120 percent of the spot price. Clearly, there's no reason for that other than the fact of trying to get everyone to get out of the, uh, on the long side. So, you, you know, granted that you can certainly do these things. Uh, I think, though, that you don't resort to those measures until you have to. Sort of, until you have to. Well, we'll continue the teaser tomorrow uh, after the last, last uh, session in the afternoon. Okay, we hopefully will have the room again available I think so. after I think four o'clock and then we'll continue this because that's open-ended we could just uh, carry on it's and on but, days, yes. but it's fascinating I am absolutely fascinated that uh, uh, I mean the writing was on the wall all time but nobody really started speculating on this until now when the banks are falling like a uh, house of cards. But, but it's amazing to me that the bullion banks saw this, that you went bilaterally with the hedging and the central bank leasing, and how they thought that you could have the, the hedging go away and then you're on the hook for the le lease. How, what was in their mind to think that this could work out in any way? I mean, aside of uh, any sort of monetary credit crisis, this is, it's, you know, suicide. it alone is, yeah, is sort of suicide for, for them. Uh, 
and, and the liability. So they're, they don't <laughs> they're not suicidal. They, they, they know something that we don't, obviously, because they're not suicidal, right? right. No, but it so may that. be that they expected that they would be able to get gold in normal conditions, that, that there would yeah. always be a seller who would supply the price would not go too excessive, yeah. and they would be acquirable. And I think what, what I find interesting that's happening now is this unprecedented retail demand. And that is sucking more metal off the wholesale. The big 400 ounce bars are being melted down and converted. Even though production capacity is limited, the fact that every mint is at maximum churning out as much as possible means that physical metal is coming off the market. And that metal will not come back. Those no, people no, are they're going to hold on. They're not an institutional investor. Yeah. They offer them a bit yeah. more, the price goes up, they'll take a profit, they'll no. let's send, sell, supply that metal back into the market, which may help them able to get out of this position. And it's as more and more people and as more and more retail demand sucks more and more physical out, because the only thing that squares, scares the bullion banks ultimately in the end is physical metal being pulled out of the London market, physically right. out of the vaults. Right, removed. As it removes and disappears, that's what scares them. It's because gone forever, no right. It never comes around. back. But yeah, I think you're right. Maybe there wasn't a choice. Maybe, you know, I'm thinking about this as the bullion banks could have bilaterally unwound these things, but in fact, they saw that that's not possible. So unwinding one leg was by necessity because the mining company de demanded it. Yeah. But there's just really no choice to, to unwind the central, the, yeah. the leasing, leasing side of it because the gold was never going to come back. Okay. Yep. So, so the first time. The intent, the original intent of the leasing was to keep the price of gold down anyway. That's what Frank Veneroso always believed. And that's what his work at Gata showed. And he was the one who discovered that there was leasing going on that was far greater than they said. And 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 he and his uh, Veneroso's premise was that all that gold was out there was leased, and now that the price is moving up, they can't get it back. He said the demand on the market is so phenomenal with the amount of gold out there, it's not coming back. So that gets back to Professor's point that uh, a private citizen purchasing gold from the Perth Mint is actually voting, and that's the power of the people that gold has. I like to vote multiple yeah. times. Damn it! But in a way, they, they've been voting, right? I mean, with this 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 lease gold, that's never going to come back. In fact, those are already votes it's, that have taken place. It's early voting or voting by wrong. ballot or whatever. Really? And, and the, the professor and wrote an article. Excuse me. The professor wrote an article. Gold being distributed into private hands, and I think this is very pertinent yeah. right now. It's going from. A concentrated source, and it's disappearing. And I Go, going into hiding. Hiding. You wrote a whole article on this. So correct. not just being dissipated, but purposely going into hiding. That's the title, is it? Gold going into hiding. And is there anything other than gold and silver which can hide so almost perfectly? I mean, if you ha own an inventory of crude oil, can you send it into hiding <laughs> unless you put it in a submarine and I mean perhaps diamonds but we have yeah. reasons to suspect that well, it's not, yeah. Yeah, that's, not a good, that's not a good way to do it now here's the difference between the liability of say an investment bank and the liability of a bullion bank the liability of an investment bank is such that you can put a dollar figure on it. It could be a very big number, but it, there is a, such a number. But fiat. when you... In fiat. Correct. Well, the, do, well, the dollar, dollar figure. Yeah, yeah, okay. But when it comes to the liability of a bullion bank, which is a liability of gold, there is no figure you can put on it in dollars because because nobody knows what, that in a, in a financial crisis which we have right now what the value of that gold will be yeah. so if if you s say that we have seen the worst we certainly haven't, because all we have seen is a few commercial banks going belly up, a few investment banks going belly up, but we haven't seen yet a bullion bank going belly up. And just wait and see, and then you will... <laughs> if that happens, we should all just close shop and move to a cave. But uh, the, here, the, here's, here's the end, and I forgot to mention this earlier, actually, I had this on here, but uh, um, and maybe after this we can really end it as... Uh, uh, there's actually only been sort of one or two articles that have hinted that this is actually happening. Uh, 
I think it was early October, the Financial Times had an article that I don't know, even know where the sourcing was or how they found this out, that in fact there was some gold leases that were being called in. Now, yeah. I don't think it was by the central banks because there's gold leasing being done by all sorts of different parties. But uh, I would maintain that, that that actually had an impact on the price, pretty close, uh, uh, pretty close related. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, gold has, if you followed sort of the forward rates or, or the basis, the last couple of months, the, the basis in, in gold and silver have both declined very, very substantially, almost to to the point of going being par and perhaps going into backwardation. This is all, this this may only be several tons that has created you know created this. Um, and when we're talking about six thousand tons, you can see it's, it's yeah. you know, bubbles of the mind. But so that's that's also another reason I think this is you know really timely because really this is the first time that there's been anything that's been written about this and. In fact, it's and only one little article in one two, place. Two um, I, I don't recall. I try to look. I try to look it up and remember. You know, sort of Google it or whatever. I couldn't find the other one. Um, but but, uh, but it was about the same time. It, I, as I recall, I think. It was yeah, I saw that. It was out there. A week or two. But they're not least. They're not re re rolling over the lease. Yeah. Right. Right. So, okay. Well that's, it. well, that's it, folks. Um, I liked today, and it was good, and we'll start again tomorrow. <laughs>